while hunting for inspiration for a new video, I stumbled upon this stunning website that won award site of the day back in January. As I scrolled through it, one section instantly caught my eye, this clean, well-executed animation sequence that felt like a dynamic timeline for the product. Right in the center of the page, a 3D model rotates smoothly as the user scrolls. Around it, bold market text slides in, followed by a circular mask that smoothly transitions to the next scene, then another marquee, and finally a set of tooltip texts that animate in, each one tied precisely to your scroll, all within a single seamless section. The way it was all put together, clean, thoughtful, and visually engaging, made it clear this was something I wanted to rebuild. So I hopped on Sketchfab and found a free 3D model that fit the concept perfectly. I'll drop the link in the description if you want to grab it. You can download it in the GLP format. Using that model, I built out a similar experience using GSAP, Scroll Trigger, and 3JS, bringing in all the key animations you saw earlier. In today's video, I'll walk you through how to take any 3D model and integrate it into your web page using 3JS, then use GSAP and Scroll Trigger to animate everything around it for a truly immersive scroll experience. If you enjoy award-winning web animations broken down and rebuilt from scratch, give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want to access the source code for this project plus hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new full website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's get into it. Let's start by setting up the basic HTML structure. I'll create three main sections, an intro, a product overview, and an outro, each with its own unique class. Inside the intro and outro sections, I'll just drop in a simple heading using h1 tag, nothing fancy, just enough content so the page doesn't feel empty. Now the real focus is the product overview section. This is where all of our animations will live. First, I'll add a div with the class adder1 and place an h1 inside it. This will be the first marquee style text that appears when the section gets pinned. Right after that, I'll add another div called header2 with a second heading. This will slide in as the follow-up text in the animation timeline. Next, I'm adding an empty div with the class circular mask. This will serve as the dark circular background that scales up after the first header scrolls out. Now it's time to build the tooltip section. I'll wrap everything inside a div called tooltips. Each tooltip will have four parts, an icon, a divider, a title, and a short description. For the icon, I'll use an icon, but you can use any other icon or image you want. The divider will just be an empty div for now, we'll style it later with CSS. Then I'll add a title using h2 and a short paragraph for the description text. Once that's set up, I'll duplicate the entire tooltip block to add a second one and swap out the content. Finally, we need a container to render the 3D model, so I'll add an empty div with the class model container, and that wraps up the HTML structure. Let's move on to styling it with CSS. First, I'll import the new Montreal font and apply a basic reset. I'll remove all default margins and paddings and set box sizing to border box for every element. Then I'll apply the font to the entire body so the typography stays consistent across the layout. Next, I'll style the headings and paragraphs. For H1, I'll go with a large size, medium weight, and tight line spacing. For H2, I'll slightly reduce the size, add title letter spacing, and keep the line height balanced. And for the paragraph, I'll keep it simple, medium weight, and a relaxed line height for better readability. Now, I'll set up the base section layout. Each section will take up the full width and height of the screen. I'll give it a light background color, dark text, and hide any overflow so it doesn't interfere with the scroll-based animations. For the intro and outro sections, I'll center everything using Flexbox and give them a black background with white text. This will help them stand out and frame the main content. Next, I'll set up the model container. I'll position it absolutely at the center of the screen using top, left, and transform. It will stretch across the full width and height and sit on a high Z index to make sure it renders above other elements. Now let's take care of the headers. For header 1, I'll make it relatively positioned and twice the width of the screen. This is the one we'll animate horizontally like a marquee. Then for the header 2, I'll fix it to the top left of the screen and start it off to the right. This one will animate in later and set above everything else using Z index. Both headers will use Flexbox to vertically center the content. Inside them, I'll use huge, bold type for that bold, animated text feel.
Now I style the circular mask. This is a full section element that starts completely hidden using a circular clip path set to 0%. I'll animate this later to create that dramatic circular reveal effect. Time to move on to the tooltips. I'll center the entire tooltips container using Flexbox and size it to about 3 quarters of the section. Inside it, I'll create two tooltips spaced far apart horizontally. Each tooltip will have four elements, an icon, a divider, a title, and a description. I'll stack them vertically with some spacing. The first tooltip will align to the top left by default. For the second one, I'll push it down and to the right using justify content and align items. For the icon, I'll scale it up for visibility. The divider will be a thin horizontal line. I'll keep it hidden by default with a 0x scale and animate it later with gsap. I'll also set the transform origin so one expands from the right and the other from the left. For the text, I'll add consistent spacing and limit the width of the second tooltips elements to create an offset asymmetrical layout. Now to prep for animations, I'll assign specific class names to the headers, titles and descriptions so we can target them later using GSAP's split text plugin. We'll use JavaScript to break the text into individual lines or characters during the runtime, not manually in HTML. Finally, I'll add responsive styles using a media query. On smaller screens, I'll reduce the font sizes for headings and icons. I'll stack the tooltips vertically and recenter everything to keep the layout clean. I'll also reset alignment on the second tooltip so it flows naturally in the vertical layout. Divider widths and transform origins will adjust as needed to keep things smooth across devices. That wraps up the CSS. Now the layout is fully styled and animation ready. So let's jump into the JavaScript. Alright, first, I'm going to import all the libraries we'll need for this project. I'll import 3 to handle the 3D rendering and GLTF loader so we can load our 3D model in GLB format. Next, I'll bring in GSAP for animations along with scroll trigger for scroll based motion and split text for breaking up text into lines or characters so we can animate them later. And finally, I'll import Lenis. This is the smooth scroll library we'll be using to enhance scroll behavior across the entire page. Once the DOM is ready, I'll register the GSAP plugins we are going to use, scroll trigger and split text. Then I'll initialize Lenis. Lenis listens to the native scroll and gives us a smoother, more fluid scrolling experience. I'll hook it up to GSAP sticker, which means Lenis will be updated on every animation frame. I'm also turning off GSAP's internal lag smoothing so everything stays in sync, especially for long scroll based animations. Now let's prepare our text for animation. I'll use the split text plugin on the first header, which is the marker text. Here, I'll split the text into individual characters and assign each one a custom class so we can target them with animations later. Then, I'll do the same for the tooltip titles and descriptions, but instead of splitting them by character, I'll split them line by line. This will help us animate each line in sequence. Finally, I'll wrap each character and each line in a span. This is important. By wrapping the text manually in spans, I get full control over the animation for each piece of text, including staggered transitions and custom motion effects. That sets up our scroll, text, and plugin configuration. In the next part, we'll dive into the scroll trigger logic and the 3D model setup. So next, I'll define some animation options we'll reuse throughout this project. I'm creating a config object called AnimOptions. It defines the default animation duration, easing curve, and a small stagger value. This way, I don't have to rewrite these settings every time I call GSAP animation. Next, I'll define an array called tooltip selectors. Each object in this array represents a tooltip animation group. I'll assign it a trigger value. This is the scroll progress percentage at which I want each tooltip to animate in. For example, when the scroll reaches around 65%, I want to animate the icon, title, lines, and description lines of the first tooltip. And then at around 85%, I'll trigger the second tooltip's animation in the same way. This setup makes the tooltip animation timeline modular and clean. I can easily loop over these groups later and animate each set based on scroll progress. Now I'll create a scroll trigger for the first marquee header, the one inside header 1. This trigger activates when the product overview section enters the viewport from bottom, specifically when its top hits 75% of the screen. When that happens, I'll animate all the span wrapped characters inside the first header by sliding them up into view from below. 
that gives that smooth letter by letter rolling effect we saw earlier. I'll also define what happens if the user scrolls back up. When the section scrolls out in reverse, I'll animate the same characters downward again, resetting their position and allowing the animation to replay if needed. That takes care of the animated entrance for our first setting. In the next part, I'll move on to setting up the 3D scene using 3JS. First, I'll declare a few variables to store our model reference, its size and a rotation tracker. I'll use this later to position and animate the model accurately during scroll. Next, I'll create a new scene. This acts as the container that holds everything we render, lights, models, cameras, all of it. Then, I'll create a perspective camera. I'm using a field of view of 60 degrees and I'm calculating the aspect ratio based on the current window size. I'm also defining the near and far clipping planes so 3JS knows what range of depth to render. After that, I'll set up the WebGL renderer. I'll enable anti-aliasing for smoother edges and make the background transparent by setting alpha to true. Then I'll configure the renderer. I'll clear out the background to transparent black. I'll set its size to match the full window and make sure it respects high resolution screens by clamping the pixel ratio to a max of 2. I'll enable shadows and specify the type of shadow map for better quality. I'll also apply basic tone mapping and output encoding to make sure lighting looks natural. Finally, I'll append the render to the model container div in our HTML so it shows up in the right section. Now it's time to light the scene. I'll add a soft ambient light to brighten up the entire model uniformly. Then I'll add a directional light that acts as the sunlight. I'll position it at an angle, enable shadows and fine tune the shadow bias and map size for performance and visual quality. To fill in the darker areas and reduce harsh shadows, I'll also add a second directional light on the opposite side with a lower intensity. This helps create a more balanced, professional lighting setup. Now let's handle model positioning. I'll write a function called setupModel that positions the 3D model based on its size and the screen dimensions. Inside this function, I'll first check if the model and its size are available. Then I'll use 3JS box utility to calculate the bounding box of the model and I'll extract the center point. If the screen is mobile sized, I'll shift the model slightly to the right, otherwise I'll push it to the left so it aligns nicely with the tooltip layout. I'll also adjust the model's vertical position by nudging it up slightly. This makes sure it feels visually centered in the viewport. You might need to play around this value when you use another model. For rotation, I'll tilt the model slightly on desktop using a negative Z rotation and leave it straight on mobile. Then, I'll position the camera based on the model size. I'll calculate the distance using the largest dimensions of the model's bounding box and multiply it by a factor closer on desktop and slightly farther on mobile to keep the model nicely framed. Finally, I'll position the camera toward the center of the scene so the model stays in focus. Now let's load the actual 3D model using GLTF loader. I'll load the file called shaker.glb. Once the model loads, I'll store the scene inside our model variable. I'll loop through each node inside the model and update its material settings, reducing metalness and increasing roughness to give it a more matte plastic-like appearance, which works better for this product style. Then I'll use box3 again to measure the model's dimensions and store its size. This is important for responsive positioning. Once that's done, I'll add the model to the scene and call our setup model function to position it correctly. Now I'll define our animation loop. I'll use request animation frame to call the animate function continuously. Inside it, I'll render the scene using the current camera settings. This will keep our 3D view updating smoothly. Lastly, I'll add a resize event listener. If the window size changes, I'll update the camera's aspect ratio and projection metrics, resize the render, and rerun setup model function so the model always stays properly framed, no matter what device or orientation the user is on. That completes our 3JS setup. In the next part, We'll connect everything to the scroll timeline and start animating the model and UI based on scroll progress. I'll create a scroll trigger instance that targets the product overview section. I want this section to pin in place and drive all animations based on scroll progress. I'll start the trigger when the top of the section hits the top of the viewport and I'll set the endpoint to extend 10 full viewport heights below. This gives us a long scroll distance to work with for smooth drawn out transitions. 
I'll enable pinning so this action stays fixed during the scroll period and I'll keep pin spacing enabled to maintain layout flow. Next, I'll turn on scrub which links scroll progress directly to the animation timing. That way, everything moves in sync with how fast or slow the user scrolls. Inside the on update callback, I'll receive a progress value. This value ranges from 0 to 1 and tells me exactly how far we are through the scroll timeline. Now, I'll start animating based on the scroll progress. First up is the horizontal scroll for header 1. I want this text to scroll from right to left as the page progresses. To control the range, I'll calculate header progress by normalizing the scroll range from 5% to 35%. I'll clamp the result between 0 and 1 using max and min methods. Then, I'll shift the header using x% starting at 0 and moving to 100%. This makes the text move completely off screen to the left as user scroll progresses. Next, I'll animate the circular mask that scales up between 20% and 30% of the scroll. I'll calculate the size of the mask based on where we are in that specific range. Below 20%, the mask stays hidden. Above 30%, it's fully expanded. In between, I'll scale it proportionally using a linear interpolation. Then, I'll apply the mask size using the clip path property with a circular value centered on the screen. Now, let's animate header 2, which enters after the first header scrolls out. I'll map the scroll progress between 15% and 50%. At the start, the second header begins completely off screen to the right at 100%. By the midpoint, it moves across and exits to the left at minus 200%. This gives it a smooth continuous motion that overlaps with other elements. I'll calculate that motion using another interpolated value and animate its x%. Percent. After that, I'll animate the tooltip dividers. I'll control the horizontal scale of each line between 45% and 65% of the scroll. The scale grows from 0 to 100% across this range, giving a clean sliding effect from either the left or right depending on the tooltip. I'll pass in the previously defined anim options to keep the easing and timing consistent with the rest of the animation. Then, I'll loop over the tooltip selectors array I defined earlier. For each group, I'll define if the scroll progress has passed the defined trigger value around 65% for the first tooltip and 85% for the second. If we have passed that point, I'll animate the tooltip elements upward into view by moving their Y position to 0%. If we haven't reached that point yet, I'll move them down to 125%, keeping them hidden. This keeps the tooltips synced precisely with scroll timing. Finally, I'll rotate the 3D model as we scroll. Once I pass 5% progress, I'll begin rotating the model around its y-axis. I'll map the scroll range from 5% to 100% and use it to calculate rotation progress. Then, I'll multiply that by a large number of radians, specifically 3 full rotations, repeated 4 times, for a total of 12 full spins. Next, I'll calculate the difference between the current rotation and the target rotation. If the difference is significant, I'll apply a rotation step using rotate on axis and then update the current rotation tracker so it stays in sync. This technique lets the model rotate smoothly and progressively as the user scrolls without skipping or snapping. And that's it. Now everything on the page is controlled by scroll, the headers animate, the circular mask reveals the next scene, the tooltips slide in one by one, and the 3D product spins in real time all linked together in a single scroll timeline. That wraps up the JavaScript. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.